the season. A few months after the spin launched in May, we gained a terrific director then, John D. Wright, who snapped up the pace and inspired the crew to nail every shot. Besides looking good, this episode stirs up one of our favorite topics and his too, sex. Happy holidays. Hello, welcome to Silicon Spin, the show that tackles high-tech issues. I'm your host, John C. Dvorak, and along with our panel of pundits, we want to air your comments. So visit the unbelievable website we've thrown up just for this show alone, zdtv.com slash Silicon Spin. Today's topics on Silicon Spin. Protecting kids' privacy, Congress looks at websites that solicit information from children, and the joy of cyber sex, at least according to one author. Before we get to those issues, let's introduce today's panelists. Playing right guard is Deb Levine, who is the author of The Joy of Cybersex. At left guard, Greg Hill, San Francisco Bureau Chief for the Wall Street Journal. At right end, John Gillis, online producer for ZDTV. And finally, our SAC specialist, left tackle, Janet Ray Dupree, who is a technology reporter for the San Jose Mercury News. Most kids are told, don't talk to strangers. But what if this talking is with someone familiar like a cartoon character? Online advertisers are using all sorts of tricky methods to get information from kids. But now Congress aims to shut them down, or at least shoot them down. Congress begins hearings Wednesday on a bill that would stop online advertisers from collecting information from children. Many marketeers offer games, prizes, and contests in exchange for names, email, and street addresses. Some sites ask, how much is your allowance? Where does your mommy work? Where does daddy shop? After an answer or two, the spam and junk mail are sure to follow. If Congress approves the bill, sites will have to get a parent's consent before getting information from any kid age 12 or under. With 16 million kids online, how can government begin to even think about protecting them? Janet Ray Dupree, uh, how, how should parents handle this? I'm really curious how they expect to get a parent's permission. I mean, kids have been forging notes to school for <laughs> as long as uh, kids have been in school, and I can't imagine that they're going to be able to get a parent's permission. They can't. Yeah, so I, I don't understand what the legislation is supposed to be about. I mean, are they are they just trying to tell the companies, thou shalt not collect information from, from children at all? And if that's what they're telling them, then they ought to go ahead and say that. Um, but then it's, it's also difficult to say, you, you've had uh, camel cigarettes for the longest time. A world of chaos. Now, there's a new television network, ZDTV, your home for entertainment, explaining the power of computers and the internet, creating a world of possibilities. ZDTV, amaze yourself. Y2K, Y2K. Just kidding, folks. Happy New Year. It's not just surf and flirt on the net these days. It's getting hardcore. The place to get a date may no longer be a smoky bar, but a steamy chat room. Chat rooms are relatively safe and anonymous. A way for many people to act out wild fantasies, but psychologically, cybersex can be problematic, even destructive. Some surfers even prefer virtual sex to the real thing and are turning off their real-life partners to pursue their cyber lives. The trend has doctors using terms like internetaholic, cyber sex junkies, and the catchy terminal affairs. Others are happy to promote cyber sex. Deb Levine is the author of a book, The Joy of Cyber Sex, and is an online sex advisor. Her book's filled with dating and sex tips, including something about mangoes. Deb, uh, tell us more and give us a little background on this book. Sure. Um, I do tend to look at the positive ways the computer and the internet in particular can be used as a tool to enhance people's real life sex lives. Um, I'd say that the basic audience is people who are using their computers for email, um, maybe some word processing, but haven't really explored enough. They're curious, but they don't really know what's out there. Curious about, for example, what would they be curious about? Chat um, rooms on AOL, they'd probably run into those because people IM you you know, which sends you instant messages. Absolutely. But, what, but how far do they go after that? Because if you really wanted to get into t serious chatting, you go to the IRC. Right. But I'd say the average user right now has no idea what an IRC is. 
or what the IRC is. Um, only a few hundred thousand people on there, so I guess I know. I'm not doing that. No. I know, but AOL chat rooms are a lot more common, and the instant messages, and you know, you get if as a woman, if you fill out a profile um, on America Online, the minute you sign on, you get an instant message saying, "Want a cyber? Want to have sex?" And you sort of sitting there saying, "What is this? Um, how did they even know I was a woman?" Because you forgot you filled out the profile. They didn't care. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> they don't care. Yeah. No. <laughs> Um, it's it's interesting and and also curious just to see you know what are other people doing am I normal it's such a huge audience out there that's on the internet um, that you get really a chance to compare and say well you know I've been having this fantasy and just wondering if anybody else ever had that. and then you can discuss it anonymously and see what, what people say like you're sick mm -hmm. or yeah hey I've been thinking the same thing right mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely and um, people also get a chance um, if they're amateur writers to practice well not practice but to write erotic online that's a really big way that um, people use the internet sexually and writing erotic stories so I can write dirty and talk dirty mm -hmm. actually there is a, there is a number of uh, kind of uh, sites not that I spend a lot of time looking for erotica online no but no but there's some sites that I've run into accidentally I was gonna say sometimes you can't avoid it that that are like people's collections of this stuff and and most most of it to be honest about it is dreadful mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what, what people, have you been on any of these things? Have you looked at it? You've been, you must have been in a chat room once in your life. Well, I, I actually, I, I took a look at some pornographic sites once just to see how much money they're making. Because this is the, you know, I work for the Wall Street Journal. We're only oh, interested. Oh, that's the ticket. Only interested Research. In return on investment, yeah. Mm -hmm. Return on investment. Well, are these guys, that's, a, that's actually an issue here, is that do they make money on those sites? Because you get the feeling when you read the articles in publications like the Wall Street Journal that, these, that people are like cleaning up. They, you know, they, the, the lone co-ed, you know, at Michigan State, you know, she puts up the site, she's making $10,000 a month. Only pornographers in the Wall Street Journal are making money on the, uh, on the web, <laughs> as far as I can tell. And AOL. We're, we're, oh, and the AOL. Yahoo. Yahoo. AOL. Yahoo. Yahoo. Right. AOL, they come and they go, you know. Sometimes they make money, sometimes they lose a bundle. They're uh, not consistent. I'll tell you, though, these, these online chats, and particularly the sexual chat rooms, is the hidden killer app of AOL. That's w why they're so popular, yep. is this sort of community. Mm -hmm. And I don't think uh, Steve Case goes around saying he's an online pornographer, but a uh, smutty chat on AOL is a huge activity. For yeah, that, have you ever seen a picture of the guy? Yes. I think he just needs a couple of gold chains and he'd be right, <laughs> he'd be right in there. But I, I wonder about email personas, because uh, my reporters tell me that when I get on email, my, my persona becomes much more cruel. And my wife is much more friendly to me on email than she is in person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and this is a phenomenon that everyone remarks upon, that when you're in e email, your persona changes, and it sincerely changes. It's not a, a you're not trying to deceive anybody. Uh, isn't that a problem when, you're, um, when you finally meet the person and their persona changes back to their real persona? Well, I have to be honest. I encourage people who meet online to fairly quickly move the um, relationship to a face-to-face -face meeting, and that is just because of what you're saying. You can people have their online personas, and as you're talking and speaking to them, you conjure up and you imagine what they're like, and then you meet them in person. And you know, 90% of the time, you're disappointed. You meet, you know, they're different than what you expect. Well, this is like a version of the blind date. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Isn't this? But, but but isn't it no, dangerous? The only the only middleman is the internet. You know. Since the internet really is a thriving community, these are people meeting each other through a community and then finally making them. That would have been terrific. That might have undermined Saddam. As it is, you know, it's sort of symbolic. I don't think.